and videotaped now for more than 50 years. All that news has become a unique record of our times, and that's where we come in on this episode of Time and Again. Some of the most unforgettable images of the 20th century, moments of tragedy and triumph, of hope and achievement, moments of history shared by all of us through television and preserved in the archives of NBC News. The first true president of the television age was John F. Kennedy, and it was with his death that television news came of age. On a Friday afternoon in November 1963, an entire nation tuned in to watch a tragedy unfold. White House Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff has just announced that President Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time, which is about 35 minutes ago. After being shot at. After being shot. By an unknown assailant. By an unknown assailant. During a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. During a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. The president died. The president died. Approximately 25 minutes. Approximately 25 minutes. After the attack took place. After the attack took place. He had been rushed, bleeding, and unconscious. He had been rushed, bleeding, and unconscious. To the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. To the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas and was given blood transfusion and was given blood transfusion about 15 minutes ago about 15 minutes ago reports nbc's bob mcneil from dallas to whom i'm talking now a priest emerged a priest emerged after having given the president after having given the president the last right the last right as the news spread americans gathered around their television sets what we saw during those november days we would never forget the hurried swearing in of a new president aboard the plane that had carried Kennedy to Dallas just hours before. The young widow stained with her husband's blood, staying close to his casket for the return trip to Washington. President Johnson with his first words to the nation. I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God. Soon came news from Dallas, the arrest of a suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald, that the violence wasn't over. Sunday afternoon, November 24th, NBC News live coverage. In just seconds, a shock for a nation already in shock. To Dallas, Texas, and Tom Pettit. The yeah, there, there is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Detectives have their guns drawn. Oswald has been shot. There is no question about it. Oswald has been shot. Pandemonium has broken loose here in the uh, basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Lee Oswald obviously has been shot. The witnesses around us here seem to confirm that. It happened so fast and with such suddenness that you can understand it is virtually impossible to determine the direction from which the bullet came, although uh, uh, police obviously uh, in a rather uh, excited state are attempting to determine where the shot came from. You have one man, do you not, yes. Captain? Yes, I didn't see it, so we've got the man I think did it. Here he comes. Here's Oswald again. He is now lying very pale on the stretcher. He's being put into the ambulance. Captain, where will he be taken? I'm assuming Parkland Hospital. Parkland Hospital, the irony of ironies, the place where President John F. Kennedy died. With that, America had watched its first murder live on national television. Just one half hour later that Sunday afternoon, all eyes were on the White House. A wheeled caisson, drawn by six matched grays, arrived at the north portico of the White House shortly before 1 p.m. Then came Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy, pale but composed, holding the hands of daughter Caroline and son John Jr. Along Constitution Avenue to the Capitol Plaza, the cortege made its way through silent crowds 10 and 12 deep. Police estimated the throng at more than 300,000, many of whom had stood waiting for hours since before dawn. At 
left the Capitol as the Navy band played the Navy hymn, the casket was lifted from the caisson, carried into the rotunda, and placed on the Lincoln catapult. Mrs. Kennedy, her face drawn and tired, but miraculously still composed, followed close behind and took her place among the mourners. She stood stiff and erect as the eulogies echoed through the chamber. And then the collective heart of the nation missed one, two, three beats as Mrs. Kennedy and Caroline walked slowly to the beer. They knelt, the two heads bowed as one. And then Mrs. Kennedy leaned forward and kissed the flag on her husband's casket. Mother and daughter rose and walked slowly then with immense dignity back to their places. The next day was John F. Kennedy Jr.'s third birthday. It was also the day of his father's funeral, an occasion witnessed by millions of people across the country and around the world on television. as much time as you want to spend before making these decisions, but you must make decisions. I may not be a great president, but as long as I'm here, I'm going to try to be a good president and do my dead level best to see this system preserved because when the final chips are down, it's not going to be the number of people we have or the number of acres or the number of resources that win. The thing that's going to make us uh, win is our system of government. When you come into office, in the presidency, uh, one has ideas as to what he can accomplish. Uh, and he believes he can accomplish a great deal even though he may have a Congress that is not part of his own party. Uh, and then after he gets in, he finds that uh, what he had hoped in terms of achieving goals uh, will not be as great as uh, the actual performance turns out to be. Uh, when presidents begin to worry about images, when they begin to be concerned about polls, when they begin to read their press clippings, you know what happens? They, they, they become like the athletes, the football teams and the rest. 
who become so concerned about what is written about them and what is said about them that they don't play the game well. Uh, my feeling is, is very, very strong on that point. I think the public man, and particularly the president, with the enormous responsibilities that he has, must not be constantly preening in front of a mirror, uh, wondering whether or not he's getting across as this kind of an individual or that. He's got to be sure that he disciplines himself, that he does the very best possible job he can for this country. And that's what I'm doing. I don't we worry about polls. I don't worry about images. I'm not going to start. I never have. As a matter of fact, if I had worried about what my image was, if I had worried about my standing in the polls, I wouldn't be sitting here now. Someone else would. I never anticipated that I would be in the White House in this building where this uh, uh, program is originating. I had other political ambitions, and I prepared myself primarily for those uh, objectives. But nevertheless, uh, even though I've wondered how it all happened, uh, I feel very secure in the capability that I have to do the job. Uh, and I can assure you that uh, my feeling of uh, security, my feeling of certainty that I can handle it, uh, grows every day. But nevertheless, you can't help but wonder sometimes, uh, uh, how did it all happen? We've cut out a lot of the frills and ceremonies from the White House, which are obnoxious to me. I, I just, if, if nobody knew about it, I still wouldn't want them to be present in my own life. I believe that this uh, is compatible with the, with the way I, I live and my family live. The uh, wearing of informal clothes, I ordinarily wear blue jeans around, around the uh, White House when my day's work is over. Even at night when I go back to the Oval Office to work, um, Quite often, I, I wear uh, blue jeans, which I've done all my life. Uh, these were not uh, contrived, uh, artificial things to create an impression. Mr. President, you've had about three weeks here in the White House now. How do you like it so far? Well, uh, it's exciting, sometimes frustrating. But uh, it's been so busy that uh, I'm almost caught unawares when you ask a question like that. But I, I have to say I like actually now being able to deal with the things that for so long a time all we've done is talk about. We have been with you all day and you have been in one meeting and then another meeting and then another meeting. Do you like to work that way? Is that effective for you? No, but then I know that there are some days like that. And not every day is like this one where it just went from, from literally one to the other. Uh, but I said it was a little frustrating. On days like that, I see the things pile up on my desk and the folders come in, information, so that, and I haven't even time to open them. Well, give them absolute choice. How do you like to work? Do you like to talk to your group, to your staff, and make joint decisions? Or you make the decision, but you discuss them jointly? Oh, I, I like the input, yes, of other people. And our cabinet meetings are that way also. We uh, probably found there today. But... That is the only difference between, I've heard them referred to, referred to as a board of directors or something. That's the only difference. I have to make the decision. Mr. President, I think it was Thomas Jefferson who said that no man takes from the presidency the reputation that he brings into it. What kind of a reputation would you like to leave behind? It's a good, a good and a tougher question than it sounds. I'd like to leave honor. I'd like to conduct myself in this job with honor, and, that, and this is in the sense that, that uh, would enhance the concept of public service. People talk about the strength of your marriage, but has it been altered by the fact that he's now President of the United States? Well, oh. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I think maybe we're closer. Really? I think so. Well, first of all... Um, he's home. He's home, and I can run over there, <laughs> and uh, I have enormous respect. No, it doesn't need to. This this job doesn't need to throw strains on uh, on a marriage. I think it brings you closer together, because you share in so many things. That's you know that's really a, a, I think the dream for a man and a woman to feel you can share in each other's lives a little bit. You have lived in the public arena for most of your adult life as the governor of Arkansas, a nationally known politician. 
but were you prepared for the fishbowl existence of living at the White House and being the President of the United States with every utterance, every body move examined and interpreted? I'm not sure that I was entirely prepared for it. I think I was a little bit, but the, um, the extent to which the President's every word has the capacity to, to wound or to uplift, uh, the extent to which every offhand remark can be interpreted or misinterpreted, the extent to which even your body language can send out signals which are uh, significant in their impact, and the extent to which you simply have no privacy at all except when you're on the second floor of the White House, and even there it's, you know, somewhat limited with all the folks kind of coming back and forth. I don't think I was entirely prepared for it. I've always been a curiously... Uh, private person, as has my wife, as is my daughter, and uh, it's, that's been a little bit uh, of a problem. I mean, I think, you know, on the balance, we've enjoyed living in the White House, and we've had a good life here, and, uh, and it's getting better, but it's taken some adjustment.